one point or another that we had somebody in our life who overestimated our abilities and capabilities, right? We've, we've all, had, probably your mom at one point or another thought that you could probably do something that you thought you couldn't do. Now, I'm going to tell you a story that I told here. Uh, it, I actually look back. It was the fourth sermon I gave as the pastor of this church. So uh, this was almost four years ago. So some of you were here, but you probably forgot about it anyways. And some of you weren't here. So I'm going to tell this story again that might be familiar to you. I remember when uh, my son Holden was like four or five years old, we were in Ohio and we were staying in a hotel and we were playing in the pool. And I was in the pool and Holden was standing on the side of the pool. And I was encouraging Holden. I said, Holden, just jump into the water. And Holden would stand at the side of the pool and he, you know, he'd swing his arms back and forth and, and he would count one, two, three, and then he wouldn't jump. And so he, he would just... He, my Beth and, and his sister Hope tried to encourage him to jump into the pool. And I was trying to get him to jump into the pool. And he he just kept going through this over and over and over again, where he just stand inside of the pool. And I'd asked him, I'd said, hold on, why won't you jump into the pool? He said, he gave me all these excuses. Well, the water's too deep. What if it goes over my head? What if I don't jump far enough and you don't catch me? What if you let go of me and I go under the water? I said, hold on, just trust me just jump into the water. And he would stand there at the side, one, two, and then he just wouldn't jump. And we just kept going through this over and over and over again because he was afraid to jump in over his head. And I think probably all of us in this room at one point or another in our lives were like Holden standing on the side of the pool where we may have felt that nudge from God or maybe the, the nudge from somebody else in our life to to get involved somehow, to serve in some way. And we felt that nudge and we, we were standing there at the side and, and we were just kind of hesitant to jump in. And maybe you used a lot of excuses too about all of your inadequacies. Well, well I don't know enough or uh, what if the water's over my head and, and I'm just not prepared enough for this. And, and what you discovered is that if you did jump in is that your faith started to increase. And that is really the whole intention of this series for the last few weeks is increase how God grows our faith. And we're talking about five things that God uses to increase and to grow our faith. If you were here the first week, I talked about how God uses uh, just our active obedience, practical teaching in order to increase our faith. And, and if you remember that first week, I told you that only believing can be deceiving. And, and how God uses this practical teaching that, that not just that we believe things, but when we actually do what is true, that our faith increases. And last week, if you were here, uh, the second thing that God uses to grow our faith is, is private disciplines. And I told you last week that disciplines facilitate increase. That, that in any every area of our life, that if we practice discipline, that we, we see great benefits in that. And I encourage you last week to pray, to pre-decide to pray and to read your Bible and attend church. And, and when we start to do those things, that our faith just naturally increases. And today's the third thing that we're talking about that God uses to increase our faith, and that is what we call personal ministry. Because the people who have been involved in personal ministry, the people who were on the side of the pool and they felt that nudge and they, they said, you know, uh, I, I really didn't feel prepared, but you know what? I volunteered to help out a kids club and, and I was around all these kids and I wasn't sure how it was going to work out, but my faith increased. Or that, that moment where I was asked to be a small group leader and I was afraid that somebody was going to ask me a question that I didn't have the answer to, but you know what? I jumped in and my faith increased. Or that time that, that I was asked to, to be involved in an outreach ministry, and I had never shared my faith with anyone before. But you know what? I just, I just felt a nudge, and I jumped in, and as a result, my faith increased. Because, because we discover that when we're involved in personal ministry, because of the people that we meet, and the ways in which God ultimately uses us, naturally, our faith increases. So God uses personal ministry to increase our faith. And the truth that I want to give you today that we're going to see in Matthew chapter 14 is just simply this, as we talk about personal ministry, is just simply make available what you are able. 
Just simply make available what you're able. The people who, who have jumped in and were involved in personal ministry, when they, when they felt like they didn't have the time, they didn't have the resources, they felt that maybe they were too old or too young or, or just didn't have the right education or the right experiences, that when they jumped in, when they just simply made available what they were able, and they said, you know what, I don't have it all, but I'm going to give you what I got, their faith naturally increased. And one of the things that God uses to grow our frail, feeble, fragile faith into faith that is unmistakable, unbreakable, and unshakable that will withstand the storms of this life is personal ministry and just simply make available what you are able. And that is what the disciples learned as they were with Jesus. And if you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read all these accounts of Jesus and his interactions with his disciples, there are so many times where Jesus seems seemingly, sometimes intentionally, put his disciples in situations where he knew they were incapable, they realized that they were incapable, and he put them in these positions so that their faith would naturally increase as they were involved in ministry. And, and we're going to come to an account here, as I said, in Matthew chapter 14. And this is an event that all four gospel writers talk about. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all write about this event. And this event that I'm going to talk about is probably very, very, very familiar to you. And each of these writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all write about it, but they all offer some a little bit different details as they offer it. And some offer details that others kind of didn't offer at that point. So we're going to look at Matthew 14, but I'm going to draw on some of these other accounts as well as we look at how these disciples learned to make available what was able. And they jumped into personal ministry and God increased their faith. And so what we're going to see here in Matthew chapter 14 is how God did this. And the first thing that we see in this account is the invitation to personal ministry. Now, in Matthew chapter 14, the beginning of this chapter starts with the beheading of John the Baptist. John the Baptist had been speaking out, and the king, of course, didn't like that. He had him put in jail. And long story short, eventually, John the Baptist he, he was beheaded. His head was chopped off. It was presented to the king's wife. His head was given to her on a platter. And of course, John the Baptist was the forerunner to Jesus. He was probably a cousin of Jesus and probably very close to Jesus. And so after this happens, if you look in chapter 14, beginning in verse 12, it says this, Matthew writes this, John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Here, Jesus had just heard that his cousin, the forerunner, the, the person who had baptized him, the person who kind of ushered in the ministry that Jesus was about to have on earth, he's now dead. Jesus receives the word that John the Baptist has been killed and J Matthew says that Jesus went away to a solitary place. He got his disciples together, said, guys, let's, let's go somewhere. We need to be alone for, for, uh, for a season here. We need to kind of get our minds right. And, and maybe he's saddened, maybe he's angry. I'm not really sure what he's experiencing, but he wanted to go to a solitary place. But Matthew says, hearing this, the crowds followed him on foot from, from the town. So, so he's on the lake there. He's riding a boat and, and everybody sees Jesus. Everybody wants to, to meet Jesus. Everybody wants to hear what Jesus has to say. There's people that are probably bringing their relatives, their friends that are sick and they want Jesus to touch them and Jesus to heal them. And so they, they see him going by boat and they said, all right, let's all go to where Jesus is going. And so they heard this, and they followed him from foot by the towns. In verse 14, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. He's going to be by himself. He gets off the boat. There are thousands of people standing around here. And Matthew writes this in such a way, it, literally what, he, what Matthew wrote here was, Jesus was moved by compassion. It was a passive verb, meant that something was being done to Jesus. And, and the compassion that Jesus had moved him because he looked at all of these people, these 
thousands of people who were standing there ready to meet him. He was moved with compassion for them. And he started to heal their sick. So Jesus is involved in this ministry, and he's, he's healing all these people. Some time goes by, and Matthew writes in verse 15, As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the village and buy themselves some food. Jesus, <laughs> look, we're out here in the middle of nowhere. I mean, this is like Bellwood, Pennsylvania. And we have all of these people who are standing around here. There's thousands of people here. There's no place for them to get any food. So it's, it's getting late now before the sun goes down. Why don't you send them away so they can go home or they can go back to the villages and the towns and they can find something to eat? Because they're not going to find anything to eat here where we're at. Because, right, you wanted to come to this solitary, secluded place and there's nothing here. We're in the middle of nowhere. And notice what Jesus says to his disciples next. He says to his disciples, he said to them in verse 15, he said, Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And at this moment, Jesus invited the disciples into personal ministry. He said, they don't, they don't have to go away. Guys, why don't you... Give them something. Jesus was inviting the disciples into his compassion for the people. Jesus was inviting, inviting his disciples. He said, why don't you join me in what I'm about to do here? His invitation to them was, hey, I'm inviting you right now to kind of take, you're standing at the edge of the pool. I'm inviting you to jump in right now because I'm inviting you to see your faith increase. And what John's description of what happened here, when John wrote about this, when it gets to this point, when Jesus said, no, you don't send them away, you give them something to see. John recalled, he said, Jesus said this, testing them. Now, I don't know if after the resurrection, that time that Jesus was on earth was 40 days, he, he tells John, hey, John, remember that time? That, that I, you know, all those people were standing there and, and you guys came to me and said, hey, they need to go away so they can find something to eat. And remember when I said to you, hey, you give them something to eat? <laughs> you know what I was doing there? I was, I was, I was testing you. I, I was testing your faith. I wanted to see how you were going to respond in that moment when I asked you, no, 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 you give them something to eat that it really was just a test of your faith. John, what I was trying to do there, I was trying to move you from that, that frail, feeble, fragile faith. I, I wanted you to jump in so that your faith would grow to become unmistakable, unbreakable, and unshakable. When I said to you, John, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Ultimately, I wanted to increase your faith, and I wanted you to learn at that moment, just make available what you were able. And then Matthew goes on and describes this next, and the next thing that we see is not just the invitation of personal ministry, but the involvement in personal ministry. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away, you give them something to eat. Now, in Mark's account, right after Jesus said this, you give them something. When Mark described this, Mark said, hey, Philip spoke up at that moment. The disciple Philip, he said, Jesus, we could work for eight months. We could work every day for eight months and save up all the money that we get from those eight months and go and buy food. And that still wouldn't be enough food to feed all of these people. Like you're asking us to feed these people. We don't have that kind of money. We don't have that kind of resources. There's no way we can feed all of these people. So, so Philip says that. And then John's account of what happens, he says Andrew, the disciple Andrew, starts looking around to see, is there any food that maybe we could collect what people have, and, and maybe we can use that to distribute to everybody. And Andrew comes back, and he says to them, you can see here in verse 17, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish. Andrew looks around and he says, you know, we looked and all we have is a Hong Kong Fui lunchbox. It's probably not Hong Kong Fui. The, the next service is not going to understand who Hong Kong Fui is. But we looked around and all we have 
is one boy's lunch. Five loaves and two fish. And you're thinking, well, that seems like a lot. So I was thinking, what would that look like in today's world? Well, that would look like five Hawaiian rolls and two cans of tuna fish. So Jesus, we looked around. There's thousands of people standing around. You've asked us to give them something to eat. We looked around. This is what we got. It's all we have. But don't miss Jesus' next words. In verse 15, or verse 18, he says, Bring them here to me. Just bring it here to me. Make available what you're able. Because this is how God worked throughout all of history, right? Right? God said his people, when they were in in bondage to the Egyptians, God said, hey, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt. And then he says to Moses, Moses, I want you to go and do this. I want to involve you in what I'm doing. When when God said, hey, I'm going to bring you together as a nation, and you're going to be my people, and then he comes to this boy as he's out there watching the sheep. He says, David, I I want you to lead and protect. I want to involve you in what I'm doing here. We come to the New Testament, Jesus says to his disciples, I will build my church. And by the way, Peter, John, Paul, I want to involve you in what I'm doing. God's invitation to what he is doing always involves his people. And here, Jesus, uh, he invites them. He says, I want you, I'm inviting you to join me in what I'm about to do here. So so just bring me what you got. And some of you are sitting here today and you're thinking, "How? I mean, this is all I got. And some of us have more loaves than fish. Some have more fish than loaves. But Jesus wants to involve all of us in personal ministry, and he's just simply saying, bring me what you got. Just bring them here to me. Make available what you are able. And that's the call that still goes today. Today, God still wants to involve his people in what he is seeking to do. So let me just ask you today, what breaks your heart? Who has God moved you to have compassion on? Maybe maybe today you're thinking, you know, the kids in my school. And Jesus is saying, okay, then just bring me what you got. It, it might be that your coworkers, and Jesus is calling you today, just, okay, just bring me what you got. It may be the homeless. It may be the fatherless. And, and you have great compassion here. And Jesus is saying, just, just bring me what you got. It might be your neighbors or your neighborhood or your family members, and, and you're not sure really how, you, you feel the nudge to do something here, but, but you're, you're saying, I'm just so inadequate, I don't have the capability, and Jesus would say to you, just bring me what you got. And then in verse 19, he directed the people to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. I don't know if this was the same prayer, that uh, a very similar prayer to what he offered in, in front of the tomb of Lazarus when he said, you know, God, I'm praying here, and I'm praying. I know what you're going to do here, but I'm just praying so that everybody who's standing around can hear me praying so that they know that you and I are on the same page here. I don't know if it's a similar prayer to that, but he prayed and he broke the loaves then. Then he gave them to the disciples. And you know what the disciples did there? They made available what they were able. And and he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. The disciples made available what they were able, and they trusted Jesus to do what what they were unable to do. They they did what they could do and trusted that Jesus knew what he was up to. (laughs) They just simply did what they knew how to do, and they trusted that Jesus would come through. And he gave it to the disciples, and the disciples just simply said, all right, we gave them what we had. 
We're going to do what we're able to do here, and we're just going to give it out to all the people. And Jesus at that moment, he, involved, he knew what he was going to do from the very beginning, but he invited them and he said, I want to involve you in what I'm doing. And they gave it to all the people. We know how the story ends. If you read in verse 20, they, ate, they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. So we're thousands of people here, ate with just one boy's lunch. And Matthew says they picked up even more leftovers than what they started with. And they just simply made available what they were able. And we come to the end of that chapter, and we come to the end of that account, and we think that that's the end of the story. But that's not the end of the story, because what I want you to see next is the insight in personal ministry. Because in verse 22, it says, Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. I want you to imagine what it must have been like there that day. I mean, everybody's excited. I mean, we just ate an entire meal from one boy's lunch, and Jesus multiplied this. There had to have been laughing, and all the disciples are probably giving each other high fives. And I imagine Philip saying to Bartholomew, Holy mackerel, we're on a roll. Thank you. (laughs) So in the midst of all that excitement, Matthew says immediately, he says, guys, let's, let's, you got to all pick, let's go. Jesus, I mean, don't you see, immediately he made them get into the boat and he said, I want you to go to the other side because I'm going to dismiss the crowd. And this is another story that you're probably all familiar with. As they're traveling across the lake, a storm blows in and the boat is tossed from side to side and all the disciples think they're going to drown. And Jesus shows up, he's walking on the water, and they're all terrified when they see Jesus. And Jesus says to them, it's me, don't be afraid. And Mark described it this way in Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse number 50. Because they all saw him and were terrified, immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves, and their hearts were hardened. The whole reason Jesus invited them and involved them in personal ministry was for them to gain insight. He said, guys, as I was walking on the water, I was hoping you would connect the dots. Because the same God who provided for you in that moment in ministry is the same God who's going to provide for you in the midst of your storm. Just as you trusted me when you jumped into ministry, so I, the same way I, want, I wanted you to trust me when the boat seemed like it was going to sink. And the whole reason I involved you in the loaves and the fish was so that your faith would increase and that you would trust me more. I positioned you in a place so that your frail, feeble, fragile faith would grow into faith that was unmistakable, unshakable, and unbreakable. So he said, I wanted you to connect the dots here. But at that moment, they were unable to do it. But personal ministry will grow and increase your faith. So here we stand 2,000 years later. And we read this account that is so familiar to all of us. And we see how Matthew and, and Andrew and Philip and how they all responded in the events of that day, and we're left asking ourselves the question, because all of this is true, what should we do? And I think that if we had Matthew and Philip and Andrew and Bartholomew standing here, they would first of all tell you that great joke that I told you earlier. But, <laughs> but the second thing, they would just simply tell you this, because this is true, this is what Jesus wants you to do. Jump in. 
just, just jump in. You're standing at the edge of the pool and you're swinging your arms back and forth and you're coming up with all of these excuses as to why you're inadequate. And you're thinking, I don't have the time, I don't have the resources, I don't have the education, I don't have the experiences. And all of these guys who were here the day that they saw Jesus do what he did with what they had available, they would all say to us today, just jump in. Like, I know you're scared. I know how inadequate you really feel. I know like you're, you, you, you feel like you, you can't do this, but just jump in. So jump in. And as we think about jumping in, there's a couple questions that I think maybe we should ask ourselves. Number one is, what is your heart? What's my heart? And I ask this for I ask this specifically because I want you to know what you're passionate about. Because there are some things that just kind of get you up in the morning, and there's other things that you could just really care less about. So what is it? What, what, what groups of people just are you passionate about? Maybe it's orphans, maybe it's the homeless, maybe it's veterans, maybe it's people with disabilities, maybe it's addicts, but, but what are those people when you think about it? Maybe it's kids, maybe it's college students, but when you think about this group of people, you say, boy, I really have a heart for them and I, I really wish God would do something in the midst of their lives. And you know what God would say to you? Hey, I'm inviting you to be involved with that. What are, what are some causes that, cause the, 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 that you're just passionate about? Maybe it's discipleship. Maybe it's uh, education. But, but what are those things, what are those, those causes that you're passionate about? Because God has given all of us passion, and He said, I've given you this so that you would use that, so you would just simply make available what you're able and join me in what I'm doing in the world. Because I love what Henry Blackaby said. Well, he wrote a book entitled Experiencing God. And Henry Blackaby said this. He said, what you and I should do is find out where God's working and just join him. <laughs> just join him in what he is doing. So what is your heart? What are some people? What are some groups? What are some organizations? What are some causes that, that you would say, that, that, that's me, just passionate about those things? Because God, God gave you that passion for a reason. So what's your heart? And then secondly, ask yourself, what is my part? <laughs> like, what do I have available? And just simply make available what you're able. What's in your lunchbox? What are your experiences, your education, your time, your talents, your treasures? And you may say, well, I don't have a whole lot of any of those. And Jesus would say to you, just bring me what you got. Just make available what you're able. And allow me to do what you can't do. You do what you can do. And trust me. To come through. Just make available what you're able. So I want you to think about this. Maybe write this down. This might be something you put on your mirror and your steering wheel in your car, on your refrigerator, someplace that you go often. Okay. Just ask yourself this question. This would be a good question to ask yourself every morning when you get out of bed. If you knew God was with you, what would you do? What would you do if you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, God was with you. And then, once you're able to answer that question, just jump in. Just make available what you are able. And what you're going to discover as a result of that, when you jump in, your, your faith is going to begin to increase. It's going to become unmistakable, unshakable, and unbreakable. And sometimes we need to jump in before we're ready. Because honestly, we're never ready. 
We need to jump in before we know how it's going to turn out because honestly, we never know how it's going to turn out. So just simply jump in because the people who jump in are the people who change the world. The people who jump in are the people who change someone's world. The people who jump in are the people who ultimately have the unmistakable, unshakable, unbreakable faith. And the people who stand on the side of the pool and just say, no, their faith remains frail, feeble, and fragile. And the moment the storm comes, (coughs) the moment the storm comes, their faith is not there. So just jump in and make available what you are able, and you will be glad that you did. Because here's the thing, you never know who or what hangs in the balance of you jumping in. But the one thing for sure that always hangs in the balance is the quality and the strength of your faith. So jump in. I was in the pool. This seemed to go on for about 20 minutes. Holden would come to the edge. He would stand there, count to three. He would walk away. One time his sister tried to push him in. That didn't work out so well. And he would just stand there on the edge. One, two, three. And finally, finally, after like 20, 25 minutes, Tentatively, but he he eventually Holden eventually jumped in. I caught him. I can't say he didn't go under the water, but he he did go in under the water. He was in over his head, and he came up out of the water. And he had this huge smile on his face, and he looked at me and he said, "Dad, that was awesome." And he got out of the pool, went to the edge. I mean, didn't even count this time. He just jumped right in. And and he kept doing this. He kept getting out of the pool, jumping back in. And you know what? After he did it the first time, the second time became much easier. And the third time was easier. The fourth time was easier. And every time he jumped, he trusted that I was going to be there to catch him. And his faith in me grew greater and greater and greater to the point in which one time I turned around, I was talking to somebody, and he jumped in when I wasn't even ready, and he landed on my back of my head, and he went under the water, and, and I grabbed him, and I pulled him out, and again, he said, that was awesome. And the same is true for you. If you will just jump in, despite your in, inadequacies and your lack of abilities and your lack of time, if you just gently jump in, and make available what you are able, it's going to be awesome. And your faith will increase. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the ways in which it speaks to us. And and I thank you that in all the things that you're seeking to do in the world around us, that you want to involve us. And so I pray that if there's any here today, they're standing on the side of the pool and they can, they can feel your nudging, your leading to, to jump in, but they, they've just been hesitant. God, I pray that, that they would just take the, take the leap, cross that line of faith. And as a result, that they would learn to trust you more and more and more and see how you're going to use them in their workplace and in their family and in their community and in in the church in order to strengthen and expand your kingdom. So we thank you and look forward to how you are going to use us for your sake. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.